Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Piruz Nurian. I'm an assistant professor of design informatics, and it's my pleasure to be with you today to uh, give you an introduction to uh, generative design research methodology. It's quite a mouthful. Don't worry about all the text that uh, you see on the slides. You will receive the slides afterwards on, uh, in a, through a link, and there's also a recording. So hi to everyone who is online, and hi to everyone who's going to see this in future. I can state the date, 21st of October, 2021, okay? So uh, by the time you see this, everything will be outdated already. Okay, so without further ado, I can, uh, I can get started, but I, I, can, I can somehow start with a kind of a rhetorical question. Do you think there's any difference between this, uh, this stuff on the screen? <laughs> they kind of look all the same, right? A bunch of... Uh, colored voxels, as we call them. I have a pack with me if you want to try it out for yourself, but I hope I can get these 16 voxels back. You can make one for yourself and see how they work. Oops, sorry. Um, do you think there's a difference between them? Imagine there are buildings. Is there any difference? So I would say if you think there's no difference between this configuration, that configuration, etc., then we can close the shop and go all go home and enjoy our lives. <laughs> but the question is, if there's a difference between them, what's the difference between them? How can we measure that difference? How can we do this right? right? So this can be the configuration of a building. right? This is in a nutshell what uh, generative design is all about. Um, I decided to first give you the... Uh, a picture of the end goals. So these are the, the potential graduation topics. These are the avenues for future, future research that uh, we are working on right now. So don't worry, again, you don't need to read the slides. Uh, you have all of them actually on our website, um, genesislab.dev. And uh, these are categorized into three main uh, major topics. Mathematical design optimization, uh, such as topology optimization, shape optimization, um, and grammatical design customization, such as these projects, and gamified participatory design, as well as some projects that have something to do with uh, artificial intelligence and digital twinning, all for the purposes uh, that I mentioned, design optimization, design customization, and participatory design. So if you ask me why we are doing this digital stuff, we don't do digital design because we want to automate the jobs of human beings. Uh, not at all. On the contrary, we want to, make, uh, we want to help people to uh, land on more meaningful jobs, and, and we want people to be in control. We don't want the the tech companies to be in control of design. We are not aiming for automation of design. We are uh, aiming for transparency, explainability, and, and what else? Uh, higher levels of sustainability, in a nutshell. I will tell you a little bit more. These are our veterans. Uh, Anastasia has, I can say, I think she has delivered the best thesis ever in, in this line of work already. This was a fully mathematical process for uh, for deriving or deducing the right shape for a, for a building configuration based on uh, solar climatic uh, goals. Uh, the thesis is going to be available on our website soon. Uh, Selena, another veteran, I mean, I, they're, they're all the best, uh, so I cannot advertise enough for them. Selena also worked on a uh, generative design project, uh, and immediately after her graduation, she started a PhD. Uh, research position at ETH Zurich in the block research group. Aditya, whose work is now on the stands downstairs for, um, for the Archipri competition. So you can look them up on our website. And Beza, whose uh, work is a beautiful design game for participatory design of um, housing complexes. So in a nutshell, so I, I thought I could start with examples to give you some, some concrete idea of what we're talking about. But in a nutshell, as I said, uh, generative design is, is an umbrella term referring to the processes that, that uh, 
are developed for design optimization, mathematical design optimization, participatory design, and design customization through grammatical itemization processes. I will show you uh, some uh, precise definitions of these things. But in a nutshell, a uh, long time ago, people thought we, do, we only do computation because we want to optimize and arrive at one solution. But this is the bigger picture that is also about customization, a lot about customization and participation, right? So these are our end goals. So um, let's say the, the hidden agenda of today, which is not so hidden, is to talk about the scientific method and how the scientific method can be applied to design. So you might be wondering, what is the scientific method? The scientific method, in a nutshell, is, to, um, is, is, uh, is an idea that has been circulating around since at least the age of enlightenment, which is about uh, ways to ascertain the truth of, of uh, claims, statements, etc., by means of repeatable experiments. How can we, how can we verify that uh, something is true? How can we uh, experiment uh, systematically? And how can we also discover, uh, for instance, uh, this is another sense that we are adding to this. How can we discover the, the right solution for a problem? How can we formulate problems? These, these things are all somehow encapsulated in the idea of the scientific method. So our ethos is, is to, uh, to uh, 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 be front runners in open science, aim for mathematical transparency, uh, scientific discovery, apply the methods of scientific discovery to design, and uh, we aim for participatory decision making, explainable artificial intelligence, not, not using black boxes that we cannot explain. And maybe needless to say, but I, I would like to state it out loud, we uh, are doing all of these things uh, through uh, modular processes and modular products, so uh, we aim for reproducibility, which is the the quality that if I if I do this experiment and you do the same experiment, you will get to the same answer, right? So there is no uh, virtually there is no possibility of bias uh, entering into the decision making process and a lot of critical thinking. And so the raison d'être or the reasons for existence of this thing, uh, uh, in a nutshell, efficacy. We want to make sure that the the, 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 the design methods are effective, that they can help us attain our goals and, and, and satisfy the constraints of design. And equity, how can we, how can we compare different uh, alternatives and make sure that they're equitable for the, for the inhabitants, et cetera, sustainability, circularity, et cetera, et cetera. But also some very specific things such as ergonomics and human factors can be taken into account in, in our picture. Because we think that architecture engineering is not uh, exactly similar to, let's say, um, a pure engineering field. Uh, there are human factors and ergonomics involved in architecture engineering. There are also subjective matters, for, for instance, that people want to have a way to uh, identify themselves with, the, with their homes, for instance, and that they need to have uh, the possibility to customize their, their homes, their buildings for themselves. So these are subjective matters, but we also have very, very objective matters and the, the, the whole physical complexity of design comes from, from these facts that we have spatial complexity to begin with, right? So that the space that we are working with is far from being a, a, a plain, let's say Euclidean space in which uh, the distance between two points is is through a straight line. If you decide to go from here to the service point, you cannot fly through the walls and the floors, right? You have to go through a network, which is a rather complex structure. I will explain what complexity is exactly. And there are usually multiple criteria to, to, uh, to address in a design process. And so appraisal of, of uh, design alternatives is also a very complex task. And there are multiple actors involved. And the, the design outcome should be somehow fair or understandable to these actors, and these actors are, we want the, the actors to have a way to interact with the whole process. So in a nutshell, this is our picture of what the relevance of generative design. So we uh, specifically dis, uh, uh, devise these processes to, uh, uh, for design the processes for optimization, participation, and customization to to contribute to these intersections of uh, 
you know, social and environmental comfort, economic and environmental efficiency, and economic and social equity. So these are all sort of equally important in our picture. And in a nutshell, again, so when you are thinking of design optimization, then uh, in, in a mathematical sense, the, the optimization processes that we have are, um, let's say, fully objective and mathematical because we are dealing with environmental factors which are objective, you know, regardless of our opinion that the climate is changing and, and we need to do something about it and we can objectively formulate our goals. Here we have more subjective goals that we want to differentiate the, the building stock, etc. And we are, here we have more intersubjective matters to deal with, which are about how is it fair between a group of actors? How, how are the design outcomes fair between a group of actors? So um, in a nutshell, I'm going to also tell you about uh, the, the, the idea of methodology and its difference with just a bunch of research methods. So in, in a nutshell, the term methodology is, is, uh, is interpreted in, in practice in, in the same way that the term technology is interpreted. When you refer to a technology, you don't refer to, I don't know, just a single tool. You are referring to a collection of techniques or or, or tools that together help you achieve something, right? In the same sense, we call uh, a methodology, a methodology uh, uh, as a collection of methods, a structured collection of methods that can help you achieve some goals. So it's more than just a bunch of research methods. The structure between these research methods, how you connect them together, uh, that defines a methodology. There are other things, so as I said, the, the, the title of the lecture is a mouthful, Generative Design Research Methodology. But in fact, every pair of these words have, have their own meaning, and I'm going to walk you through these meanings. And I hope that is uh, going to be of help for you in, in, in your future studies. So first of all, Generative Design, it's, I, I have already given you some definition. But... Um, the other things, more importantly, what is design research all about? What is research methodology about? And what can be something that we call a design methodology? Um, so once more, I can, I can specify a little bit further what generative design is all about. So well, we, we are talking about the derivation of, of design products, you could say. Uh, these products uh, can range from very abstract products, which can be... Uh, um, represented as plans, networks, and graphs, uh, showing the connectivity between the elements in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a design. This can be the connectivity structure in a, in a structure, 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 like the structure that is consisted of beams and nodes, etc. Or it can be the connections between the spaces in a design. In, in both cases, we use something that is called, uh, we use abstractions that are called networks or graphs. And in a more uh, concrete sense, you can refer to these uh, networks as configurations, layouts, or topologies. That's, that's a technical term. Or at the end, these are the things that most people are familiar with, forms, geometries, uh, or shapes, whatever you call them. So we think, uh, I think it's, it's no hidden thing, that we think that people are really preoccupied quite a lot with shapes and forms, etc. But these things are even more important. That's, that's the hidden message, yeah? Which I declared just now. Okay, so, so these terminologies, that having a clear terminology, by the way, needless to say, is, is absolutely important because sometimes I, I, I read papers, especially uh, journalistic uh, articles, etc., that really confuse people. And we need to, we don't afford these kind of confusions. We need to have a very sharp terminology. And that terminology, the terminology that, that, that we produce kind of uh, uh, meticulously is, is based on the, the mathematical terms which go beyond this company, that company, that piece of software which is for sale. And, and yeah, so my, um, if I can offer a small piece of advice, then please try to stick to a very well-defined terminology. Whatever that, it, that is, it needs to be consistent throughout your work. So when we are talking about a, a network, the, a network is different from a layout and it's different from a shape, etc. right? You will uh, get some ideas from the pictures and you can always ask, of course. 
But uh, and there are also so many other lecture notes available online uh, from our lab about these kind of topics. But okay, so back to the idea of methods and and how we view design. Yes, we are viewing design in a in a particular way. We are viewing design as a matter of, as I told you, combinatorial generation of alternatives, which is uh, something that I usually compare to uh, composing on the piano. It's a combinatorial composition with the notes, right? So they are discrete, and you, you combine them together, and you arrive at a new creation. And the other approach, which is uh, yeah, more creative or, or parametric or continuous, etc., I usually compare that to composing something on the violin. Right, so uh, the assumption, that the underlying assumption, is that we are dealing with continuous variations here, and here in in our approach, we are dealing with discrete variations. That's why I gave you those voxels to play with, right? Discrete variations, so they they can be distinct, uh, distinguished from each other easily through their distinct variations. And we are dealing with integer parameters and topological variation rather than geometric variation. Interestingly enough, you can also get a lot of shape variations from topological variations. You can imagine a smooth version of those voxels that can give you a very smooth shape if you, if you desire it. Any, anything that you see on the screen is pixelated already, right? So for the same reason, if we can voxelate any, any conceivable shape. You know, that, that's a very important notion. But yeah, so we, we, we see these things uh, maybe differently from the, from the, the more um, mainstream or conventional approach, which is uh, focused on, on shapes or parametric design. And these two can be said to be uh, different paradigms in design. What is a paradigm? A paradigm, loosely speaking, is, some, uh, uh, is a collection of worldviews, uh, conventions, protocols, methods, methodologies, techniques. And in a nutshell, loosely speaking, you can call them scientific worldviews. So this is how we view design. So Two different people from two perspectives may call this a rabbit or a duck, right? That's, uh, I think we see it as a rabbit. Uh, but uh, there's also another picture about uh, the term paradigms. This is a very famous, uh, this is from a fa very famous book from Thomas Kuhn, uh, in which he describes the, the, the so-called evolution or rev uh, re revolution, scientific revolutions in terms of the change of paradigms. So this is a time-wise picture, and sometimes you have coexisting paradigms. So that in, in, in especially in humanities, there are, for instance, behaviorism in psychology versus cognitive, cognitivism in psychology are two competing paradigms that try to describe the same thing, which is the human mind, etc. Not my cup of tea, by the way. Um, in in different ways, so they have fundamental beliefs, etc. But in 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 um, kind of like natural sciences, especially physics, there are also paradigms that evolve through time or revolve through time, you could say, and they change. So why do we change our paradigms? Because there are things that cannot be addressed with the, with the previous paradigms. For instance, with the Aristotelian paradigm uh, of science, uh, people had managed to go I don't know, through uh, thousands of years without much of a problem. The, the church was behind them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And everything seemed to work somehow, but uh, thanks to people like Copernicus and, and Galileo, etc., we, uh, we kind of moved towards the next paradigm in science, which is the paradigm that is uh, characterized with the scientific method, the earlier ver earliest versions of the scientific method, and in pursuit of uh, methodical practices for, for objectively uh, arriving at explanations and justifications uh, on observations. So there's, there was a lot of empiricism involved. So uh, the, the ideas of people like Newton were that we, we have to be able to empirically verify um, the, the facts that, that, uh, that we state. And the next paradigm in, in, in science and, and physics, I mean, uh, we can roughly call it the Einsteinian which was uh, very interesting in that the, the main driver of, of discovery and innovation was not just experimentation and, and empirical approaches, but also a lot of theoretical investigations and mathematical investigations, to be very precise. Um, so mathematics and computation have become the main drivers of science. So you, you conceive of concepts and, and methods and, and, and uh, 
uh, arrive at explanations before having done any experiment. And then later, people can, can do experiments and verify whether your, your theories make sense together or not. And these theories have a mathematical shape, like the theories of Einstein, etc. OK, so, um, so these were about paradigms and design paradigms. But where, where did I find, out, find about, uh, out something about design paradigms? That was in a field that is called design research. So there have been people, uh, especially after the Second World War, after the devastations of the Second World War, people were thinking, OK, this, this, this field of architecture, engineering, and construction is not that, that efficient uh, for, for instance, uh, rebuilding the cities after the, the devastations of the Second World War. And then they thought, OK, we need to, to do something about this. We need to have a methodical approach. And, and we need to research the, the way designers work. And we need to come up with ways to improve the ways designers work. And that um, whole um, range of studies is, uh, in a nutshell, called design research. This is a very uh, condensed description of what design research is all about. It's in a nutshell about design epistemology. I, I know that these are fancy words, but I'm, I'm doing my best to <laughs> to explain them to you. Design epistemology, which is uh, the study of, let's say, in a nutshell, design science. How how do we how do we verify our knowledge? Uh, what kind of knowledge? The knowledge that we claim to have when we say. If you do this, this will be a nice design. You know, how, how do we do? How do we know that, right? How do we ascertain that that uh, our knowledge? How do we verify uh, our knowledge, etc.? There's another branch of studies here, which is called design praxeology. The the the, the, the researchers here they study the praxis or, or the uh, the ways of putting these uh, theories or design methods into practice. They observe that the designers, the not 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 our cup of tea. And design phenomenology, which is really studying the nature of the design artifacts in a morphological sense. Uh, what are the shapes? How do they correspond to to um, to qualities that that we seek in a design process, etc. Right? Um, and yeah. So before I go further, I, I want to make a make a distinction here. There's so much of talk, especially in the old literature, about design research about the so-called tacit knowledge. We cannot work with tacit knowledge in a mathematical or computational sense. We have to work with explicit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is something that is in my head. And you know, uh, if I cannot write it on paper, then for sure I cannot do anything mathematical or computational with it. So um, I think I already introduced what, what the term methodology refers to. It's a structured collection of methods, the same way we call a technology uh, a, uh, we, we call a structured collection of techniques a technology. And so uh, the, the theoretical underpinnings as well as the connections between the methods construct a methodology. So why do we need to have a methodology in design? That, that's a big question. So uh, this, this was, uh, I, I started uh, reflecting on this after I read a paper, I think it was around 2004, from, uh, from uh, one of the professors of TU Duff, uh, Professor Peter Cruz from uh, Industrial Design. In this paper, which was about the philosophy of technology, he had identified a very clear concept, which he calls the, the logical gap, the logical leap in design. You know, that, that uh, oftentimes when you talk to a designer, uh, before they even hear what your problem is, they have a solution in their pocket, right? So they give you, voila, this is your design, right? And how did you arrive at that conclusion, right? That, that's a big question. How can you explain it to me, right? So these are very important questions. How, how, can, I, how can I justify my design decisions, et cetera, et cetera? And you need to also observe that at the beginning of a design process, you have a set of abstract uh, uh, requirements, uh, desires, goals, et cetera. You can call them roughly the, the, the function, and then the solution in your pocket is it has a form, right? So you produce it, you you plot it on, on paper, and you make a model. It's a, it has a very concrete form. This is very abstract. The user may not even know what they want, right? And this is very concrete, right? So how how did we how did we make this conclusion? That's that's in a nutshell the <laughs> the reason why we bother with methods, right? Because we want to be able to justify step by step how did we convert your 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 requirements, your goals, et cetera, into uh, gradually more concrete 
products from networks to to layouts to to shapes for instance right step by step in such a way that we can go back and trace every every single decision and and this abstraction is very important because if i start designing a building by um i don't know choosing the the the, the right door handles you know that's one approach which is the opposite of this we start from the most abstract decisions which have um arguably the the largest effect on on the final outcome if i if i choose the wrong orientation for the window i can do nothing with the with the final attainment of the building in terms of energy and daylight etc right so if it's in the wrong direction what can i do about it right so we want to address these uh, important decisions as early as possible and we start with uh, with science of course so um yeah in a nutshell i i would say as uh, the best thing you can do for for having uh, for devising systematic methods for for design is to take uh, all the scientific subjects more seriously like building physics like uh, structural design and material science we also have material science here so all these things are the main drivers of of uh, true innovation and, and 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 research in our field right and and of course uh, to some extent you may need or you may not need computer science but these things are fundamental so in a nutshell physics right so physics has many branches so these things are all related to physics um i think we don't do metaphysics here right <laughs> so only physics okay so um i'm a bit biased towards that okay so uh but other than physics and the sciences of the natural there's there's a there's a concept which is uh uh popularized by uh um by a nobel laureate by the name of uh, herbert alexander simon he's one of our prophets <laughs> so he argues that we need to identify the so called sciences of the artificial so natural sciences in a nutshell are not concerned with making things they are concerned with explaining and justifying how things work and how things are and explaining why the, they are the way they are right in a nutshell design on the other hand design management uh engineering in a nutshell you could say is about how do we change things towards better things right so the science of doing these things uh, properly or or systematically is referred to as the sciences of the artificial that's that's exactly the name of his very famous book the sciences of the artificial which is kind of our um <laughs> kind of our bible of of generative design methods right so he, his arguments are very very solid and he has he has won a nobel prize in in uh, economics in fact so his his definition of design is very appealing he says is non verbatim uh, so he says any business that is concerned with with changing the the status quo or the state of things towards better states can be referred to as some kind of a design and he also argues for developing the so called design sciences so how do we know that we are moving in the right direction how do we know that our decisions will have the right impact um so when it comes to uh, uh when the discussion comes to science and and the, the the power of science in predicting or explaining the world we we must also note that uh, science especially natural sciences are traditionally concerned with explaining causal relationships cause and effect you 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 heat up the water it boils it doesn't decide to boil or not it it just boils right so it 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 doesn't reason about am i going to boil or not it just boils right on the other hand people are not <laughs> causal systems right they 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 decide to do things you know they have intentions they have an idea of the future they anticipate things etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, the the behaviors of people cannot be uh, at least on an individual level they cannot be predicted the same way you can predict that if we heat it up to 100 degrees it will boil right you cannot predict the behavior of people this this boss is angry for no uh objectively verifiable reason and and he's shouting at the guy okay why nobody knows had a bad day is grumpy whatever what happened i think i lost that I think the angry bus somehow froze my screen. <laughs> What happened? He's really angry, huh? Yeah? Oh, 
Okay. So, <laughs> was it a coincidence? Okay, let's see. Um, the scientific method. So, as I said, the, the scientific method is a method, let, let's read it through, a, met, a method or procedure that has characterized natural sciences since natural sciences, no? Since the 17th century, more or less the Enlightenment era, consisting in systematic observation, measurements, experiments, and formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses, right? Hypotheses, right? We are, in design, we are concerned with making propositions, right? So it's slightly different, and, but I would say this is our golden, golden keyword here, formulation. How do we formulate our problems? So if we don't formulate our problems, let's say we have this gigantic machine, a supercomputer that can solve problems. How do we want to communicate with that machine? Talk to him, I mean, or him or her. It doesn't have uh, any consciousness to to refer to, and whatever we do, we have to formulate our problems, and these formulations end up being mathematical. So I don't want to uh, give you the wrong impression that, that the machine does everything. The machine doesn't do anything. The machine just solves the last lines of, let, let me give you an idea. So in, in, in this line of work, some 99 lines of code in a 100 lines uh, of, uh, a piece of 100 lines of code, some 95, 96 lines of code are about formulating the problem to a form that is understandable for a computer. The last two, three, four, five lines are for solving the problem computationally. That's not a big deal. But formulating a problem properly, mathematically, it's a big deal because that's something that you can do. You can do. That, 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 that has a lot to do with design science, with your understanding of the design process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not about the computer, it's about you. It's about how methodical you are, how systematically you can arrive at formulations and how you can mathematically model the problem. And modeling, in, in, in a nutshell, is about abstractions. I will show you some, some pictures soon enough about what modeling is all about. And computational simulation. So this is our platinum keyboard. So simulation, simulation. How, how can we simulate? So it's not just about knowing something that, that we know the answer is 100 degrees Celsius, but why? You know, can, can we simulate even the particles in a, in a bowl of water simul uh, you know, evaporating exactly at 100 degrees? That, that's, that's a true nature of science, which has explanatory powers. It's not just about if you take the red pill, you will be okay. If you take the blue pill, you will not be okay. That, that's just about making associations. That's a statistics, right? That's not science. And science can, can also explain things, can also justify things, can, can tell you exactly how. It can explain the mechanisms to which things change. And that's why we make models. So whenever I say uh, the term, uh, I mention the term model, then I, I realize that there are some confusions. Some people think of modeling as modeling for fashion. Some people think of immediately think of statistical models. So these are probably okay or perfectly fine for making associations that the red pill works, the, the blue pill doesn't work, or vice versa. Which one was it in, in the movie Matrix? <laughs> the red pill, the blue pill? You, you give it to 100 people, and then, then you check whether they, they made it to the other side or not, uh, whether they're okay or not. You know, that, that's just making associations, right? So you, you don't have yet a clue as to how the red pill or the blue pill works, right? This is, on the other hand, uh, a, a very intricate model. This is a very beautiful example in a, in a science museum in London, I believe. It's a physical model of the economy of the country, right? So how, how can that be? So with a bunch of physical mechanisms working together in, in, in some intricate way, a scientist has, has devised a model to, to replicate a part of the reality or the, or, or the dynamics of a system. So if, if the world around us didn't change at all, we wouldn't bother with modeling it, right? Why should we uh, be concerned with modeling things? Because we want to, number one, we want to predict the future. We want to be in control. We want to do something about our fear of, of uh, nature, that, that, that inherent fear that uh, it will probably rain in the next uh, five minutes. Uh, and it might, there might be a very um, disastrous flood, etc. You know, these, these things happen, right? So we, we are still in the process of predicting the nature around us and, and do something to, to cope with it, right? So this, this is a very old quest of humanity to, to, to be able to understand the nature around ourselves too and to predict how it works and to also explain it, you know? 
So we, we are, I'm an educator. I'm in the business of explaining how things work. So if, if I can only tell you that the red pill works and the blue pill doesn't work or the other way around, that doesn't cut it, right, for you, for me. So through mathematical models or computational models, you can also explain the mechanisms underlying change. That's, in a nutshell, the fundamental reason we bother with making mathematical models or computational models. This is a mathematical model of, of uh, called gravity model, but gravity model of trade. What is the, the, the proportional, um, what are the proportional rates of trade between nations being at some distance from each other, nations or human settlements, based on the distance between them. The larger the distance, the, the, the lower the, the possibility of trade or exchange or migration or any, any sort of human exchange. This is a very simple model, very effective. It works uh, in most cases in transport planning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's a long story in itself. Or Markov chains. These are my favorite models. I've, I've studied them extensively in my PhD dissertation. Uh, for instance, this is a Markov chain model of based on probabilities in a in a stock market. Well, I'm, I'm not so much interested in the stock market, but these models are very interesting for uh, modeling uh, the dynamics of change of different things in space or in time. So um, this is a very beautiful uh, editorial note from uh, Joshua Epstein. He's uh, also one of our uh, more recent prophets. He argues for the, the necessity of having generative sciences, the sciences that, that can help us simulate phenomena and, and can explain us the mechanisms. So he argues that the, the, the reasons why we model Something are, uh, cannot be reduced to only exp uh, to to only predicting the future, you know. Because let's say I, I somehow manage to buy a crystal ball from somewhere and tell you the crystal ball tells me that uh, tomorrow there will be a flood, you know. And can, can you trust me with, with that crystal ball? No, right? Um, you can uh, trust it when you can somehow explain all the all the intricate mechanisms that that underline change. And these. Uh, intricate or I would say complex mechanisms are uh, studied in the so-called complexity sciences. Um, before talking about them, first of all, you might have a very negative idea of complexity because you probably associate it with complicatedness. But complex things and complicated things are completely different, right? Well, I would say complex things can be very, very nice, like these uh, beautiful Rube Goldberg uh, machines. Complicated things, on the other hand, mm, you know, uh, not our cup of tea, <laughs> right? So we can help you with complex things, not with complicated things. Beautiful complex things, such as uh, complex systems that, that exhibit some form of collective intelligence. So a, a colony of termites, these little animals that eat wood and, and build their homes out of uh, earth and wood chips, essentially, they have managed to create something that in many ways, I would say it's not only comparable with the, with the magnificent piece of architecture uh, designed by Gaudi, but in some ways it can be argued that it is even better. And yet, it's, it's a very yeah, uh, challenging thing to think about. So how on earth a bunch of relatively stupid animals without much of a brain together can achieve something that is actually a marvel of engineering. So if you study these things in detail, in terms of the climatic performance of this skyscraper that they have built, this cathedral, I, I think, yeah, it almost looks like a cathedral, or you can call it a skyscraper, whatever it is, it's a magnificent piece of uh, engineering and design. And they have only achieved this by following some local rules of thumb, right? The, that is uh, something that they have inherited through their genes, and they have kind of collectively learned to do this. Another fascinating example is slime mold. So those animals, at least they had a brain, even though small, they had a brain. This, this thing, which I don't know how to call it because my biology is really, really poor, uh, slime mold, uh, Fisarum, I, I've forgotten the, the full name. It's, it's uh, colloquially known as slime mold. So these are like, sort of mushrooms, uh, apologies to anyone who knows something about biology, but I call them fungi or mushrooms, right? That, that uh, are in the business of, of, of uh, decomposing stuff in nature. So you find them in forests and, and some people grow them in their, in their kitchen. They're completely harmless, by the way. They eat oats, 
like the, the same kind of uh, oat grains that you probably eat for breakfast. And they grow the network to find, to forage, to, to find more food, to find more oats. They love oats, right? I also love oats. Um, and they don't have a brain, and yet they can achieve amazing things, such as this, this famous example. They have together achieved to replicate almost the, the, the network design of the Tokyo uh, railway network. So if uh, some, some researchers have placed oats in the, in the, in the position of the center, uh, nodes of the, the railroad stations and, and this, uh, I forgot the name, the slime mold has managed to replicate the shape of the network, which involves quite a lot of uh, very impressive optimizations. If you want to do this uh, computationally, the, you, it's, it's not the easy thing to do, let's put it that way, right? Again, so the, the complex system um, exhibits some form of collective intelligence emerging out of the interactions of the system. So I showed these two beautiful examples because there are, these two uh, examples are uh, examples that, that we refer to in the two courses about generative design. One is earthy and the other one is spatial computing for um, architectural design in the bachelor's program. I will give you two pictures of those courses. Okay, so back to the, the main point. Um, so when, when we deal with complexity, then, then some people immediately say, ah, we need artificial intelligence, complex, okay, baffling, etc." But the fundamental reason why we want, might want to use something like artificial intelligence is, is more than complexity, it's also uncertainty. You know, when we are facing um, uncertainty in decision making, such as distinguishing cats from dogs and don't know if you have watched this cartoon called Cat Dog. Anybody? <laughs> have you seen? <laughs> so what is a cat? What is a dog? These, these are uncertain, uncertain notions that, that uh, people can, can easily deal with, but computers cannot. So throughout history, so let's say since 1970s or sometimes it, you can trace it back to 60s, some researchers in, in computer science started replicating some forms of human reasoning uh, that are more capable of dealing with these uncertain or vague situations and decided to uh, make mathematical models, again mathematics, you know, this is not, not no mumbo jumbo, this is also mathematical, decided to devise models such as models based on fuzzy logics to, to, uh, to incorporate this uh, um, capability of dealing with vagueness, etc., into the machine. Developing machine vision, machine learning algorithms, multi-agent systems, these are especially interesting for us in, in generative design, and meta-heuristic procedures for making educated guesses systematically, etc. So in a nutshell, I, I call this huge area of work postmodern mathematics, you know. It's a, it's a term. Okay, so research methodology. So uh, I, I decided to provide you uh, with a compass that I find very useful. Um, th this is the compass that, that helped me somehow stop with this uh, endless discussion whether we should do quantitative research and qualitative research. That is just about this part. So if our only way of thinking about nature or design, etc., cetera, is, is empiricism and we have to work with empirical evidence, yeah, you, you need to choose to, to do qualitative research, quantitative research. That, that whole discussion is not my cup of tea, right? We are interested in these approaches, these approaches that are mathematical and atomistic, rationalistic. So you, you first come up with, uh, with uh, theories, which are kind of like mathematical methods that, that can be proven to or can be validated through experiments. So there's also a lot of uh, overlap with, with quantitative methods. But this is our focal uh, attention point. So this is a compass that you can refer to, to to kind of know where you are. And this would be the starting point of devising any sort of methodology. Again, as a disclaimer, I'm, I'm not saying that these methods are sufficient for doing any all kinds of research. I'm telling you that they're, that, that they're the main methods for doing generative design research, right? You may definitely need these kinds of methods in other avenues of research, right? OK, again. Um, Back to the idea of research methodology. Can, can you tell me why we need research methods in a nutshell? Let's say I um, 
let's say I'm a crazy scientist, I do some experiments with some crazy machines uh, in my lab and, and, and come up with some claims and say, the red pill works, the blue, blue, the blue pill doesn't work, etc., etc. How can you verify those facts? This meta-level knowledge, which is about our capability for verifying the truth of statements, is called epistemology, the, the study of knowledge, the knowledge about knowledge, you, you could say, if you trace back the, the, the meaning of the word in, in Greek, I believe. So um, there are different schools of thought, like uh, more or less you could say this is about uh, positivism, which... Uh, maintains that uh, only objective truth can be verified and, and we are in the context of justification on this side of the spectrum. And I, I don't want to start a huge philosophical debate, but here on the other side, you could, loosely speaking, you could say you're talking about uh, phenomenology, either taking the, the human experience more seriously uh, and also accepting that some facts can be, facts or some opinions can also be taken seriously, but there's also uh, somewhere, in, somewhere in between, like uh, um, understanding the social constructs. So these ideas about equity, fairness, etc., they have something to do with our uh, value system. So how do we, how do we in the social realm, how do we um, make consensus, etc.? So these are also very interesting for for this line of work. And the complexity sciences they kind of bridge these these barriers and and the, the gaps and and they um, sort of study systems in their full complexity. Okay, so you might be wondering a lot of blah, 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 how do I put these things into practice? Uh, I, I think, we, to be honest, we, we need a, 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 a firm, a solid foundation, epistemological foundation to know where we are going, right? I wouldn't start just uh, doing things without without planning the, the research methodology, without being absolutely sure that the research methodology has a, a solid foundation, etc. But at, at, at some point, you have to put these things into practice. Uh, this business of putting these theories into practice is called praxis. It's another uh, Greek term, uh, a way of doing something, the use of a theory or belief in a practical way. So how do we go about um, generative design research that in a nutshell I would say it's about logic in its entirety, right? Logical reasoning uh, and also in a very literal sense logic has, uh, the term has to do with logos or speech and reasoning, right? So we want to make this reasoning process that I told you about the, this problematic logical leap, we want to make it a logical reasoning process. Right, in a nutshell. I think that uh, kind of concludes it well. And as I said, there's also a very close connection to, to speech and reason, to, to what we're doing, the, the idea of generative grammars. You could, you could really trace the, the, the word generative design to, to the ideas of generative grammars from, um, from Chomsky, I will get to that in, in, a, in a moment. But uh, the other methods that, that we use are, are, yeah, so we have grammatical methods, we have mathematical methods. These grammatical methods are almost also mathematical in their nature. And yeah, so th these are some of the, the terms. And we have serious gaming for systematic negotiation, consensus building, etc. But all of them, in a sense, are kind of mathematical. And when I say mathematics, I, I must also state that I, I've read somewhere about a study apparently done by the United Nations that some saying that some 96% uh, of the world's population have some form of fear or hatred of mathematics because most people associate mathematics with numbers and, and things that are very, very uh, cumbersome and annoying. But the kind of mathematics we're talking about is about patterns, not about numbers. Yes, we also deal with numbers. We know how to count, etc. But the, the beautiful side of mathematics that you're dealing with is, is mostly concerned with patterns and, and explanations and, and making models, you know, beautiful models that work together. But this is a, a, another one of our um, prophets, I would say. Uh, Noam Chomsky, the, the famous linguist and, and uh, also a social activist, he, he came up in 1957 
uh, with the idea of generative grammars in a nutshell, uh, explaining that, that most natural languages that, that people speak, uh, that, that the children learn these languages because of their inherent capability of learning logical reasoning, and they have logical structures. So these logical structures are described in the grammar of the language that, that, that the children uh, in, in all nations, they pick, it, uh, pick these uh, logical constructs uh, kind of naturally, but you can also teach these logical structures as the grammar of a language and its syntax in, in, a, in a very systematic way. It's about identifying these sort of constructs, the noun phrases and verbal phrases and adverbal phrases in a sentence. So this is uh, Chomsky himself. Um, the idea is that by having a grammar, a formal grammar, a, 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 a logical system of building sentences out of words or components, you can create sentences and be sure that these sentences are at least grammatically valid. Whether they make sense or not, that's something else. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. That's a sentence that is grammatically correct. It is consisted of, of, of noun phrases, a big noun phrase, colorless green ideas. This is just a noun phrase. And this one is a verbal phrase, sleep furiously. right? And then you can break them down into more uh, constituent elements. But the general idea is that you can state the same kind of a sentence in any other language, any other human language. and still being able to identify these sort of phrases and, and the ways they can connect to each other, those ways can be called the syntax of a language, right? So this idea has inspired many, 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 many um, great ideas in, 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 in our line of work, namely the, the, even the term space syntax, that syntax refers to language and linguistics because of uh, the, the, the the work of Chomsky, uh, many people started talking about uh, 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 identifying these kind of logical structures in the structure of the space. The, the book, The Social Logic of Space by uh, Bill Hillier and uh, Julian Hansen. Uh, the book, A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. Um, there are a couple more books, the Towards the Scientific Design by Jonah Friedman and I think I have, I have forgotten to put these books here. But anyhow, long story short, many ideas got inspired by this uh, idea of generative grammars of Chomsky. And here I'm showing you some examples. We're getting to the end. Uh, don't worry. These are just pictures from now on. Uh, using these ideas of grammatical exploration in, in identifying the avenues that we could not possibly even look at without being able to grammatically explore all the possibilities of combining for instance, these structural elements. So let me show you in a nutshell what I'm talking about. We are talking about the tessellation of, of a, a load-bearing ceiling. And the, all the different ways that you can tessellate these roofs, they correspond to, eventually they correspond to these shapes. So you are deciding on the DNA of the structure of the roof, right? So it's, it's a very important thing to realize that, that buildings around us, sometimes in, in, the, in the digital design um, environments, we are kind of prone to, ma to, the, to making these misconceptions about the building as a monolithic thing. At the end of the day, the construction process is about putting things together and, and making something out of smaller pieces. You cannot put the whole building into a, into a gigantic mold and, and get the whole building out, right? Um, so we take these compositions, or you could say configurations or topologies very seriously because we have objective proof that, that they make they can make a huge difference in the final outcome. And if you are incapable of actually seeing those possibilities, if you can only start with one and end with one, then, then you're not really exploring all the possibilities. Then even talking about optimization, it can be, can be meaningless because you cannot see all those possibilities. Therefore, we, we think that adaptation uh, is also necessary for uh, being able to adapt and customize is also necessary for higher levels of attainment in terms of optimization. So this is uh, the grammatical approach to that. So you can see that these different tessellations or these different configurations, they actually made differences in the, the peak compressive stress, which is uh, the, the thing that we are focused on here because we are making unreinforced masonry buildings, designing these kind of buildings. We wanted to lower this. Uh, uh, this peak so that we can work with a very, very weak material. Uh, and a reminder, 
this is why constraints are so important for, for research and innovation. If you think that you can build with whatever thing, yes, you can, but you know, the, 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 the steel reinforcement in buildings is, 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 a, is a carbon bomb, you can, you can call it. The total amount of steel that is used in the construction industry is somehow insane, right? Yes, you can make a cantilever like 20 meters sticking out of the building. You do that thanks to the, the, the steel reinforcement, which embodies a huge amount of carbon, which goes to the planet, right? If we take that constraint seriously, if we are serious about sustainability goals, etc., we need to take these questions also more seriously. How can we make buildings with much less or even no steel reinforcement? You don't always need steel reinforcement if, if it's not an earthquake. Uh, uh, prone area, etc. Another example: uh, total uh, 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 a, a comprehensive uh, design discovery, you could say, process for for making these kinds of compression only structures through the uh, the process of finite element analysis of the structure. We discover which are the parts that are absolutely necessary to 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 uh, uh, to comply with the load case of the structure. If they're not necessary, they're removed step by step through the whole simulation process. We gradually discover the design and we can explain every single step and we can trace back all the decisions one by one, right? That's, that's an amazing thing. You know, we can discover the shape. We can, dis not only the topology, which is about how these little things that the voxels are connected to each other, but also the shape eventually. It's only a matter of resolution. And putting these two things together, the, the, the linguistic approach or the grammatical approach and, and mathematical approach, we can devise mathematical design games. This is, a, this is an amazing example from uh, RT 3.0, uh, the course RT from, from last year. Uh, uh, a game that is called Terra Tetris. It's about uh, mass customization of housing in, in, a, in a refugee camp. Um, the whole process is feed forward, so the, the design process starts from understanding the design requirements, uh, formulating the design requirements as a network, and then devising the, the, the layouts or, or topological plans, and then devising the, the modular elements scale by scale, so the, there's a scalar modularity in the whole process, so everything, including the construction, process is, is accounted for in the modular design and, and combinatorial uh, exploration process. And yeah, so that the, the participants or the, the prospective inhabitants can, can sort of play the game, configure their own buildings uh, for themselves uh, as a community housing complex, and they get all the all the technical drawings, etc., all the engineering process is completely uh, systematic and, and is delivered to them. And there's a lot of room for human input and creativity. You can you can do the same or similar game in a in a different style. You can make it I don't know gothic. I, I love the gothic style. Whatever. Um, you can make them I don't know in any style that you desire, right? So that that styling process, the whole. Uh, concept of the game. Everything that you see is not thanks to the computer, it's thanks to the, the beautiful ideas of the humans devising this whole process. And this process is fully in control of the humans participating in it. That's, uh, that's very important to us. This is another example, a beautiful game, which is available as a museum object next to our lab, Genesis Lab, BG Plus West 300. That's our room. Next to the room, you can see this model. I cannot get enough of it. Every time I look at it, I discover a new amazing thing about this model. I sometimes want to go back in time and, and give them all a 10 out of 10, all those students who did this pro amazing project. Um, it's a beautiful game, which is also based on uh, these grammatical ideas of, of exploration, of possibilities. I think I have explained that uh, to you already, so you can have a look at the model. This is the oldest game as such that I've been preaching about in, in the bachelor's program. Um, uh, yeah, in a nutshell, it's about solving the most complex puzzle of design, which is, which is com something that we call it the chicken and egg problem, whether we should first put the rooms together or whether we should first the corridors connecting those rooms together. It's, it's a complicated thing or a complex thing. 
depending on how seriously you take this question of configuration of a building, it can be a very daunting task to do. But this game is something that has worked consistently since 2006 and 7. First time I started preaching about this. This is a totally manual process, if you will. Uh, it always works. You know, it's about abstracting the, the space as, as rectilinear flow plates, connecting them together properly with, with stairs, ramps, etc. And yeah, this is just about the play mechanism. Now we can think of um, complementing this process with scoring mechanisms. So are we making a good configuration? But making a valid configuration is, I would say, 10 times more difficult than making a good configuration. Once you are sure that whatever you make is going to be valid, then you can comfortably start thinking about uh, good configurations, right? So keep in mind, a valid configuration or a valid design is much more important than a good design. You, know, you can only think about good designs when you are dealing with valid configurations. This is a, 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 th these pictures are from a course of spatial computing in the bachelor's program. This is about a, a process of design which is 100%, 100% digital for arriving at the, the, the configuration and the shape and everything about these buildings, including the floor plans, systematically, step by step, by means of uh, computer programming. So there is no drawing involved here. Not, not because we, we don't like drawings. We actually do a lot of drawings. But the, the whole process is, is broken down into decision-making steps, such that the, the participants or the inhabitants can, can partake in the, in the process of decision-making. And you can always trace back this building. So if I showed you first this building, you would say, OK, but I actually some." <laughs> I hope Maximilian doesn't mind. I somehow find the facade rather ugly, but anyhow. Um, the, the beauty of this process is not the facade. The, the beauty of this is that if I showed you this at the beginning, you would say it's a normal building, right? Normal in some sense. It, it looks a little bit blobby for my taste, but anyhow. It's somehow normal, and yet uh, the, the interesting thing about the process is that you can trace back every single decision, and you can change everything by means of uh, computer programs, and you can explain every single step and justify it. And you can trace it back all the way back to uh, the user requirements and what the people wanted to achieve with this building. And if you change these inputs, of course, the, the outputs change. <laughs> Two uh, quick references. This is a project that, that we are going to soon finish with a grand finale with my associate and friend, engineer Sherwin Azadi. He's sitting. Back in the room, this is a, a, a mathematical design game. Gen uh, so it's a generative design methodology project. So this game is not just about building this building. It's also a, a mathematical engine that can, that can run such games, such design participatory design games. Uh, I can I, th I think I can say anywhere in the Netherlands, right? Because we have access to the, geo, the open geodata of the Netherlands. This is running online right now. You can, if you click on the link, you can uh, you can check it out. And we are going to have the grand finale on the first of December. So if you are interested, you are more than welcome to join the grand finale game testing workshop, and you can play it online. It's again about a participatory process of putting all these uh, user requirements together. Uh, Waiting the, the design objectives and the, the game engine takes care of fairly putting those uh, decisions together and making a synthesis of those decisions. This is another uh, methodology project, Project Go Design, uh, that uh, Shervin and I have been busy with uh, since 2019. It's a project that we don't want to finish because uh, we keep uh, making and, and uh, discovering new things in, in it. It's about a process that can be identified as a process of systematic synthesis of design, uh, which is something that we uh, um, uh, explain and, and, and teach, basically, in the spatial computing course by starting from evaluations and analysis. So instead of just doing something haphazardly and then checking out whether we did the right thing or not. No, we start with the, with the analysis, we start with the evaluations, and then gradually, step by step, through the simulations and, and putting together these analyses, we literally make a synthesis of those spatial analyses, and then we arrive at the design. And throughout the whole process, there's a lot of room for 
human creativity, human participation in the design of the facade, in the design of, uh, in, in, the, in the setting of the goals, etc., etc., and in the rest of the process, the, let's say the cumbersome parts are automated, right? But the whole process is not automated as, as, a, as a big uh, black box machine that has a button to push and get the design out. That is not the intention. So these are the courses that I told you about. As I said, you get the, the slides and you can, you can check them out. They're 100% open source online and they're using open source tools. So um, because we believe that what we teach you should be based on open source tools, at least we should tell you about the alternatives. This has been a very, very long process to, to make sure that we can do everything at the cost of zero euros with open source tools, in this case, Python, right? So um, I've been in this uh, business of sales engineering, <laughs> uh, earning uh, nothing. I, I, I advertise a lot for Python. Every copy of Python costs you zero euros, and I get a commission of zero euros on every copy that we, we sell like this, right? Uh, if you ask me that uh, two, there's one, one beautiful uh, and amazing computer programming language called MATLAB, but a, a license of MATLAB, I don't know how much it costs, but anyway, it costs quite some money. I would say MATLAB is Python for the rich and Python is MATLAB for the poor, you know? Um, so we are in the sales business of Python and we use Python in these two courses and we develop tools uh, in, in, in Python recently, only in Python. Uh, we have also a history of legacy tools developed in other languages such as C Sharp uh, and Visual Basic, etc. Uh, but nowadays only in Python or mostly in Python, right? So these tools are also available on our website. They're all free. And the, the last ones are also open source and there are more coming. Uh, you can use these tools and we use these tools in our, in our courses as well. I would like to thank our scientific advisors, the people who have been uh, helping us in the uh, background for quite some time, Dr. Matthijs Langla and Professor Elma Eisenman and, and my associate friend and dear colleague, Engineer Shervin Azadi, who is the technological director, the technological mastermind behind uh, most of these recent developments. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. Any philosophical question, this is the moment. Okay. So a lot to uh, think about, right? Shoot. Don't worry. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to what extent uh, using the same knowledge can our pathologies maybe be designed for a completely different market? A com That's a great question. Can I answer that by showing you something? Uh, so, uh, if you look at, for instance, Bezos' work, uh, it was a it was a design game. So you you can look up all the all the results in uh, in her graduation report. So she designed this game specifically for the context that she was familiar with, which was Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Um, but on top of designing this particular game for that particular context, which was a lot based on the idea of the social logic of space, the, the kind of diagrams that you see on the right, these are the things that she has identified as important in the, in the, in the way of life, in the way people configured these buildings and she has abstracted them to such a degree that she has managed to put together a, 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 
a design game for that particular context, but there was also a meta level game, which, which was about designing such design games, right? So she has also recorded some of the steps that, that she has taken in, in the, uh, for studying that context, for encapsulating the, the social logic of space in that context into these kind of diagrams, etc. So you can, you can uh, trace her steps and, and see how this can be done. But in a nutshell, it's, it's really about understanding, uh, well, not only the social logic of space, but also the, the construction cultures, you know. Here we, we were kind of unsure whether we should go for a 100% masonry structure or, or we should uh, accommodate also some of the, the vernacular traditions. The vernacular traditions also include, for instance, these uh, gable roofs because of the heavy rain season, etc. So th these things, of course, influence how, how this works. But on the more abstract level, the, the configurational level, which is in a nutshell about how people move in space, right? Then in that, in that sense, uh, people all over the world are almost the same, right? So you, you have these common denominators in terms of how you connect spaces to, to make sure that they're accessible, properly connected. And, and, but properly connected, that's something that can mean different things in different contexts like, uh, slightly, right? That's something that we take seriously. And yes, there's, there's a lot of adaptation to that context, but there's also a meta-level game that, that can adapt to... Uh, uh, that can be adapted to different contexts. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it's a great question. Uh, the, the, the grammatical process is also somewhat mathematical, right? Because we, we are talking about a formal grammar in which you say, for instance, um, these elements, whatever they are, these game pieces, they can be put together if the, the domino signs on the sides match. And that encapsulates uh, a part of the connections between these uh, elements which uh, can be based on so many considerations, including the structural considerations and the uh, structural considerations that you can you can kind of identify here that the walls have to match, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But on this abstract level, this is uh, also um, based on the configurational aspects, right? So all those considerations have resulted in the system of codes that identify whether these things can be put together or not. If you want to explore the whole system of, uh, the whole space of possibilities, let's say, here, what are the all possible ways you can play this game? That will be a, a computational simulation in a nutshell. So it's, the, the definitions are mathematical, but the, the process in which we can explore all these possibilities can be computational. That's something that, uh, we're kind of doing here, right? So we are exploring these possible grammatical constructs. The rules are the same. The rules are kind of stated here, the grammatical rules of how we tessellate these structures, right? And then uh, by putting them into a computer simulation, we can see how we can make variations. But whether we do this computationally or manually, if you follow the same rules, the results, um, you know, the results can be valid, so that's a great thing. So you can also uh, th think about gamification without a computer in this sense, which is, which is a very good thing. For instance, for the game that Beza has developed, she really wanted people to play with these pieces, right? So the same ideas can, can also be put in practice without using a computer. But the whole process is systematic, you know. It's so generic that it can even explain these... Uh, uh, schools of architecture such as Gothic architecture, such as Romanesque architecture, you can identify these kinds of grammatical, uh, logical rules in, in well-established schools of architecture, school, I mean, school of thought. Uh, not, not just the style, but, but the whole vernacular schools of architecture. Usually they are pretty much systematic in the sense that you, not only you identify that they are of the same type because of their shape, but also through their configurations you can see uh, so many uh, similarities between the, the examples from a vernacular school of architecture. And um, 
Yeah, so you asked what, what is exactly the difference between the mathematical approach. So this is, in a nutshell, the grammatical approach, right? So this is the, the core business in the grammatical approach. The mathematical approach, however, the purely mathematical derivation approach, um, this one. I mean, I could, I could maybe even write on a blackboard, but anyway, that, that would confuse you a little bit more. But OK, let's say in a nutshell, we want to minimize what we call compliance in this structure, which is the, the total amount of strains in the structure. In a nutshell, if you minimize compliance, that, also, that could also mean that you have maximized stiffness, loosely, loosely speaking. So you've made it very rigid, while keeping in mind a constraint that you want to reduce the, the, the total volume of this structure to, I don't know, 30% of what, what it can be. So it could potentially be the whole thing, which is massive. Spend, uh, it takes a lot of uh, embodied energy and material, etc. And you, let's say you want to reduce that because you want to find a more elegant design and you want to end up with this. The process starts from a, a mathematical simulation of how the structure works the fine, using the finite element method. Uh, summing up, let's say, uh, loosely speaking, summing up all the strains in the structure, and then realizing the, the contribution of every single cell of space in that total amount of compliance, and then looking at the, the gradients or the, the sensitivity of the, the whole amount of compliance to existence or absence of each and every one of those cellular blocks, and the ones that have uh, a lot to contribute to the total amount of compliance, which is the, the bad thing that we want to minimize, they will be removed because by removing them, we can see from the gradients or sensitivities that they're responsible for, for the whole thing being so clumsy, et cetera, et cetera. So we remove them one by one, and then we arrive gradually at a better design. That is, in a nutshell, what is going on here. So the whole process is led by the mathematical simulation of, of the structure and how it works, right? So uh, in this case, should I say, yeah, the whole process can be sort of automated because here we are dealing with a very, very objective, objective function, right? Which is that we want to reduce the, the total uh, volume and, and, and minimize the compliance of the structure and without going less than a certain amount of volume because the structure can disappear, you know. If I ask you what is the, what's the easiest way to minimize the energy expenditure in the building, what is it? Just turn off the whole thing, right? <laughs> so you need constraints to, to keep that in balance, right? The constraint here will be comfort, right? But uh, yeah, so minimizing this in the absolute sense might mean that the, there is no structure, so minimum nothing, right? So you keep that, that, that minimum constraint. So this, the way these constraints are modeled, the way that the, the objective function is modeled, the way that the simulation works, they're all 100% mathematical in this case. And therefore, this, this process can be described as a, as a derivation process. So you derive the solution to, to the problem out of um, doing these kind of uh, simulations repeatedly and the mathematical optimization uh, process, which is at the end just for solving the, those equations, that's also 100% mathematical. So no, no trial and error, no mumbo jumbo, nothing, nothing of that kind is involved in the process, right? No guess, no guesswork, etc. right? Yeah? All right, then I would like to thank, thank you, you also for your lecture. My pleasure.